I'm back with some loose change, a mostly empty shelf, and a bin. Welcome to this star-studded episode of Bargain or Bust, movie tie-in special. That's right, we're rolling out the red carpet as I scour my local second-hand video game store to find the cheap licensed games of yesteryear. Will I find any bargains deserving of a spot on the shelf, or be left with box office bombs destined for the landfill? Licensed tie-in games have been a part of gaming history since its inception, a feature which has resulted in mixed results. Some licensed games nearly killed the industry completely, others would then pioneer new graphics and remain popular to this day. And the PlayStation 2 was certainly no stranger to them in the mid-2000s. Most blockbuster titles would inevitably be accompanied by a home console release, and given the PS2's hefty lifespan, its library is chock-a-block with games to choose from. Whether they're any good or not on the other hand remains to be seen. Licensed games were often synonymous with rush development cycles and cash-grabbing motives, so much so that the genre has pretty much died out completely in today's video game climate. But that's not going to stop me, oh no no no. It's only fair I withhold judgement and play some for myself. I headed to my trusty CEX shop and marvelled at the vast shelves of grubby PS2 boxes. Soon enough I spotted three movie tying games all costing no more than 50 pence each. Will any end up as Oscar worthy, or instead be more suited to a golden raspberry? Let's find out. We're off to Paris to begin with for some historic decryption playing the Da Vinci Code. It was released in 2006 alongside Ron Howard's film adaptation of the book by Dan Brown. Now granted I haven't read the book, or seen the film, but the prospect of unearthing some treasures playing as one of America's national treasures was enough to convince me. Plus, if you weren't able to tell looking at my channel, I'm a bit of a point and click adventure game fan. Surely all those years of finding uses for rubber chickens with pulleys in the middle, or soggy tissues, have set me up to become the ultimate symbologist, destined to find the holy grail in record time. Paris by night, but not the way I'd imagined. Wait a minute, who's that? that that's not Tom Hanks. That's not even Jim Hanks. Yeah, the sad news was, though it was released in tandem with the film, it's still just based on the book, which means no Tom, Audrey, Ian or Alfred from the silver screen. Instead, we're stuck with this lame version of Robert Langdon, who drones on and on alongside French police captain Bezu Fache, following the murder of the Louvre curator Jacques Saunier. And when I say on and on, I'm getting quite traumatising flashbacks to the previous episode of Bargain or Bust playing Primal. There I was inundated with back-to-back -back cutscenes, the most amount of actual gameplay being to move from point A to point B. In the Da Vinci Code, it's back-to-back -back cutscenes interspersed with the odd CSI style sweep of the dead body. Hold the phone, I can't handle the excitement! No, seriously, hold the phone. We also got to type in a three digit number and make a quick call. Exhilarating stuff. I realise this is an adaptation and some level of exposition is required at first, but tell the story in a more interactive way, rather than just endless dialogue. After all, isn't that the point of a game? If I wanted to watch a story, well, I've got Tom for that. Anyway, after Langdon's name is revealed in Sonnier's message before his death, the French police consider him the main murder suspect. With the help of cryptologist Sophie Navu, together they distract the DCPJ and try to decipher what Sonnier's message really meant. Almost 20, quite frankly dull minutes later, I finally get to solve a puzzle. Nothing too crazy, just a simple anagram that I solved with ease. Mm -hmm. Sonier was the curator of the Louvre. I wouldn't be surprised if this were an anagram of one of the paintings here. Gotcha. I think I know what it is. The first letter of the second world is M. Yes, 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 yes. I knew that. I was just testing Sophie. Yes, just testing Sophie. <laughs> it's not like it's on the cover of the box. No, 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 no. Okay, so it's starting off slow with the puzzles, but hey, I'm sure they'll be coming in thick and fast soon enough. But not before a stealth section. Jeez, is this really the sort of gameplay people are wanting after buying a game with this as its cover? That's right, Sophie is in need of a UV light from the evidence locker, and those pesky French police have reappeared in the Louvre. Time to stick to the shadows, crouch down, and discover that Sophie is actually a state-of-the-art lifelike Roomba. Must sneak by him. And she doesn't mess around either, most likely killing this poor bloke with a hefty whack to the head using a museum stanchion. Eh, considering how terrible these guards all were, they probably deserved it. 
Thankfully, the terrible stealth section didn't last long, and we were back to code cracking using the UV light on the Mona Lisa itself. I've never actually been to the Louvre, just outside it briefly, but I can only assume they've tried to be as accurate as possible with these environments. One thing I know is accurate is that whilst everyone clamours to get a crappy photo of the tiny Mona Lisa, there's a far more impressive painting on the opposite wall that you should look at instead. The Wedding Feast at Cana by Paolo Veronese is the biggest painting in the museum. The mammoth canvas is packed full of details as Jesus performs his first miracle turning water into wine, and it shouldn't be missed. But anyway, that's enough of Muckluck's top travel tips, let's get back to the game. With the Mona Lisa cipher uncovered, it didn't take long to substitute in some letters and discover a phrase about Bacchus and Aureole and some other paintings in the museum. But before we could continue, those pesky French police had found us, and it was time to encounter yet another gameplay element of the Da Vinci Code. We'd had puzzles, we'd had stealth, and now we were due some action-packed combat. Robert Langdon, world-renowned symbologist and fighter. Or maybe not. Combat is made up of attack and defense moves, but all these boil down to are some measly quick time events. I quickly ended up getting trounced, and with Sophie in trouble, I did what any man would do. Damn it. Run! Yeah, bye. That's not the way out. <laughs> See ya. Can I actually just leave her? <laughs> It's fine, she respawned in the next room, and everything was grand. Speaking of which, here in the grand gallery, the exciting quick time events continued. We eventually snooped around some offices, learned of something called the Priory of Scion, and even managed to squeeze in some time revising some chemistry. But ultimately, it all ended in me getting bored and just trying to rush through to the end. The game didn't like this, and sent four goons after us, so it all just became a bit of a button mashing mess. <laughs> this is not how I remember. Da Vinci go go. <laughs> oh no. I was just getting warmed up. Oh no. <laughs> it certainly wasn't a pretty sight, which can be said about the game overall. Okay, maybe that's unfair. There are definitely elements which could be impressive. The accurate depiction of the Louvre and the character models are half decent, but in its attempt to be cinematic and letterbox the frame, Everything is squished down to a muddy, blurry mess. It's like someone took a big blob of Vaseline and smeared it all over the camera. <coughs> Ultimately, the Da Vinci Code is a jack of all trades, master of none. The puzzles were uninspired, the stealth unfitting, and the combat dull. I think I'll go watch the film instead. It certainly didn't take long to decipher this game's quality, that's for sure. By the way, if you'd like to see the full recording of my time playing the Da Vinci Code, as well as all the games in this episode, head over to my second channel, More Muck Luck. And while you're there, why not subscribe? The next game I came across was none other than Charlie's Angels, a tie-in to the rebooted Charlie's Angels film from 2000. That of course was based on the original 1970s television series, and earned sequels in 2003 and more recently in 2019. Plus there was another television series thrown in there somewhere too, so no shortage of angels to go around, but if you're still not clued into the concept, it's basically just three crime fighting women working for a private detective agency. Their boss is the forever unseen Charlie Townsend who directs them over a speakerphone to various assignments where they go and save the world, and everything's okay again. In 2000, the series got a showy blockbuster reboot, starring Cameron Diaz, Lucy Liu, and Drew Barrymore as the Three Angels. A sequel, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, was released three years later, and so too was this game. Now we ourselves can use clever disguises, tactical espionage, and acrobatic martial arts to kick some serious butt. Though perhaps that should be show some serious butt instead, as we begin the game taking part in a bikini contest. Why may you ask? Well, I think you know the real reason why, but plot wise it's because we need to sneak aboard a ship that could be involved with the theft of the Statue of Liberty. Yes that's right, monument pirates are afoot, and have already nabbed Stonehenge, the Arc de Triomphe and the Lincoln Memorial. Quite how they possess the engineering skill to perform these feats is a mystery, but you've got to admit that as far as dastardly plans go, it's pretty crap. But then who needs the FBI or the world's most powerful military on the case when you've got three angels instead? 
rooftops exploding, boats sinking. You girls can't answer the phone without something catching on fire or flipping over. Good point, Buzz. We'll try not to blow anything up. If we encounter a hitch, we'll keep a lid on collateral damage. And while we're critiquing the box art, they might as well have removed the clever disguises and tactical espionage bit too, because this game has none of that. A few seconds into our bikini contest, we're mobbed by some particularly violent competitors, and its true colours were revealed. A bog standard, scarily dull beat em up. You move across the screen and spam boring combat moves. That's it. No stealth, disguises, or espionage. Just mashing triangle, square, and circle through waves and waves of boring enemies. Well, I say boring, for some reason they're all named, so you can spam away beating up the likes of Algar, Brad, or Bart. No Borts, though. Okay, okay, so it's just a beat em up. Surely they've incorporated different playstyles for each angel, especially considering you can swap between them at any point and need to complete separate tasks as each one. Oh, of course not. That would be ever so slightly interesting, and we can't be having that. They all play exactly the same. Punch, kick, grab and dodge enemies, kick a crate or two, and use weapons scattered about the stages. Watch out though, because enemies can use them too, meaning ninja wrenches fly in from off screen. There's a small bar underneath your health that you can fill up by performing combos, ready to use on Angel Enhanced Time. It's the lamest version of slow-mo bullet time I've seen yet, blurring the screen and somehow making this game even uglier. That's quite an achievement considering the all-star cast look like this. We even get some actual voice acting from them, though the term acting is a bit of a stretch when it's limited to dialogue like this. Guys, I'm ready. For the most part, you're treated to the angels' grunts and groans during combat. Or maybe they're just after some emeralds, I'm not sure. You know what, I've talked about this game enough, it's just plain bad. After the 39 second shot of Lucy Lou's backside climbing a ladder, not even the evil acrobatic butler twins could save it for me. I'll tell you the most interesting thing about all of this. The voice of Robert Langdon in the Da Vinci Code game also voiced Charlie in the 2019 film. Well, yeah, that's kinda neat. But the game itself? Definitely bin worthy. Good night, angels. We've had two stinkers so far, how's about third time's the charm? Well, if the movie quality is anything to go by, I didn't help myself by picking Eragon as our final game to play. The young adult novel by Christopher Paolini was thrust onto the big screen in 2006, poised to become the next breakout fantasy franchise. It was even marketed as the first in the Inheritance trilogy. The next fantasy adventure begins. Well, so much for that plan. The film was a dud with most criticism pointed towards its generic derivative plot and wooden dialogue. But never mind all that, this was of course prime licensed tie-in material, and so a video game version was thrown onto nearly every platform available at the time, including this lovely PS2 copy I picked up for 50 pence. Though, what's it even about anyway? Let's see here. The fate of a young unsuspecting farm boy changes forever when he discovers a dragon egg, blah blah blah, thrust into a new and dangerous world where enemies lurk every time, yada yada yada. Help Aragorn become a dragon rider. Okay, so typical chosen one stuff, but hey, we get to ride a dragon at some point, that might be cool. And in all honesty, the game starts off pretty promising. Actually, that's a lie. The game starts off with backgrounds that look like this, but afterwards, we're plonked down into a rather lovely looking forest. Sure, it's just a tutorial, but look, it's cinematic, pretty light rays peeking through, lush green foliage. It's nice. Hunting a deer, we're given the basics of traversal and archery, and soon discover that Sophie isn't the only humanoid robot in this episode. Just look at that precision. Jokes aside, the controls all play well and seem sensible enough. Different combinations of circle and X produce knockdowns, stuns and strikes, and drawing your arrow for longer gives you a stronger final shot. Nothing groundbreaking, but it works, and hey, this is only a licensed tie-in. After the tutorial we find the dragon egg, and some bald guy called Galbatorix looks very angry. Some other evil guy called Durza sends some monster zombie things called Razak to look for us in a place called Carver Hall, where we've teamed up with a hermit called Brom. Whew, are you following? It's okay though, because from this point on, things slow down. A lot. It turns out Aragon on the PS2 is very hack and slashy, and not much else. 
Brom and I chopped down wave after wave of enemies, broken up by the occasional slow-mo finishing move. Of us completely missing. But apart from that, it's sadly pretty dull. There's a team power bar which lets you use fury mode when full, but all that does is give you and Brom a fuzzy blue sword and a strength boost. You fill up the power bar by collecting power orbs from defeated enemies, but doing that just made me wish I was back playing Jack and Daxter in 2014. <sighs> oh damn you little crab! What I will say is that I'm pretty sure this game would have been a lot more enjoyable with two players, since it incorporates drop in drop out co-op mode. I didn't have that luxury and was instead left with an AI Brom, who in all fairness did a very good job of not being annoying or getting in my way. In fact I eventually grew quite attached to Brom, running courageously into battle and tearing down fences like it was nobody's business. All right. Whoa, calm down there Brom, there's no one here! Oh! Wow. Brom's so cool, he knew it. If he was actually voiced by his film counterpart Jeremy Irons, that would have been icing on the cake. Instead he was voiced by Maxwell Cauliflower, but considering he was the voice of James Bond in Nightfire, eh, that's good enough for me. A mission or two later and we're in a place called Darrett Docks, where our magical abilities are soon revealed. Conveniently placed barrels of spears can be conjured and hurled at enemies, or platforms move to create pathways. The telekinesis comes in mighty handy on these cranes, swishing them around to use as traps to drop. Other times they can clear the way forward, just uh, be sure to listen to Brom's advice. Yeah. Magic all that stuff, and then... Stand back, One arrow should do it. Stand back you say? Well I'm gonna stand right here. Hey. Uh oh, that actually did kill me. <laughs> The heroes have failed. Although the Darrett Docks level was about as colourful as a £15 Iceland's party platter, I liked it. The backgrounds were detailed and the camera angles kept things visually engaging. It's just a pity that the gameplay itself got so repetitive and dull by the end of it. We moved on to Darrett Town which was just more of the same except now we were fending off waves of enemies as villagers frantically tried to save their burning homes. Though I think the whole ordeal got a bit too much for this couple. After unlocking the town gate, I was keen to get onto one of the dragon riding levels the back of the box had teased. We were an hour into the game, surely it was time. Wrong! More Darrett Town action on the bridge, and that's where I decided to call it quits. And would you know, it was the level after this one that finally switches things up with some dragon flying. But I'm afraid it's all too little too late, especially after a quick YouTube search showed it looking like this. I'll pass, thanks. Licensed tie-ins were often criticised for trying to squeeze in too many gameplay elements at a superficial level. You only have to go back a few minutes to hear what I said about the Da Vinci Code. But in this case, Aragon just didn't try enough, and its hack and slash focus got very tiring very quickly. We may be the Dragon Rider, but the only thing we're flying into is the trash. And that's going to do it for this star-studded episode of Bargain or Bust, a triple whammy of binned games. Oh dear, not a good look for licensed games, but then maybe I was just too optimistic. And hey, we know that there are definitely some good tie-in games. Today just wasn't our day. Either way, thanks for sticking around until the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please do leave a like, and if you're not already, consider subscribing so you don't miss any in the future. If you want to watch me live, I stream regularly over at twitch.tv forward slash muckluck, and if you want to chat, come and join my Discord at Club Muckluck. See you next time, folks.